Hi, this is Harold Long. Welcome to the Hill Tran United Weekly Message and Podcast. I'm glad you're making time for this week's teaching. I will have more to say at the end, but for now, let's dive right in. And so as we get into this section, there'll be four sections, or three sections of this. They're broken into three sections as we read this scripture this morning. And, and it, it really goes in progression of David really coming clean because of the prophet Nathan really calls him on the carpet for the sin that he engaged in with Bersheba. And, uh, and so we see David in, through his pain last week in the psalm that we were in, Psalm 32. And this week we see that his confession, which was started last in the last psalm, carries over here. And we see a, a, a big confession on David's part. And it's through that confession that he experiences God's forgiveness. And joy is reestablished in his heart. He has a clean heart. And he's able to rejoice in that and celebrate in that. And so that's what we're going to um, witness here in this scripture reading today. Have mercy on me, God, according to your faithful love. Wipe away my wrongdoings according to your great compassion. Wash me completely clean of my guilt. Purify me from my sin. Because I know my wrongdoings, my sin is always right in front of me. I've sinned against you. You alone, I've committed evil in your sight. That's why you are justified when you render your verdict, completely correct when you issue your judgment. Yes, I was born in guilt, in sin, from the moment my mother conceived me. And yes, you want truth in the most hidden places. You teach me wisdom in the most secret place. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and celebration again. Let the bones you crushed rejoice once more. Hide your face from my sins. Wipe away all my guilty deeds. Create a clean heart for me, God. Put a new faithful spirit deep inside me. Please don't throw me out of your presence. Please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Return the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach wrongdoers your ways and sinners will come back to you. Deliver me from violence, God, God of my salvation, so that my tongue can sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will proclaim your praise. You don't want sacrifices. If I gave an entirely burnt offering, you wouldn't be pleased. A broken spirit is my sacrifice, God. You won't despise a heart, God, that is broken and crushed. Do good things for Zion by your favor. Rebuild Jerusalem's walls. Then you will again want sacrifice of righteousness, entirely burnt offerings and complete offerings. Then bulls will again be sacrificed on your altar. May God bless your hearing, understanding, and most importantly, your application of Scripture. You can be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. Everybody say, Jesus! Jesus. All right. Go Go Cardinals. You are worshiping an idol, my friend. One that will lead you to a joyous ending. Uh, We are in a great message series called Summer in the Psalms, and in your bulletin is the handout, is the lesson plan. Today we're going to lean heavily on it, so I encourage you to pull that out if you have a pen or pencil. encourage you to engage the lesson plan, and and, uh, as we go through our slides and our time together, I use the lesson plan most weeks. Why? Because people learn through vision, by seeing, but they also learn by hearing, but they also learn by application. So when you can engage the scripture... Uh, as we do this morning and and, and participate. It helps you lean into the message, and I think it helps you get the most out of the message. So that's why I'm a big fan of lesson plans. And it's also something you could take home and reflect on as you meditate on this message and reflect on it throughout the week. And on the back side of that lesson plan is the next six-day challenge, which has a scripture related to every day of the week that's relevant and resonates completely with what we're going through today. Um, So it just helps keep this message alive, and there's some great quotes there from some great theologians as well um, to uh, help bring this message home to what it means to have truth in our life and what it, why it's important that we be transparent. And so 
our first slide brings us to this point. And so we're going to go in three sections. The first section is going to be verse 1 through 6. And we see it says we must come, become entirely ready for God to cleanse our souls. And that word entirely is important because that's strictly on us. That's something that we have to get to this place. We have to be willing for God to come in and cleanse us, to heal us before we can become forgiven, before we have any relief over the hurts, habits, and hang-ups in our lives. And we all have different hurts, habits, and hang-ups that get on us in varying degrees, but we have to be entirely ready. And so how do you do that? What does that even look like? Well, how, how am I entirely ready for God? It's easy to give lip service to that and say, yes, God, here's my life. I'm entirely ready for you to do whatever you want, but I can promise you it's, it's not that simple because we want to hold on to that right to ourselves in a big way. So what does it look like? Well, how do we entirely give our life to God? And I think a great illustration is if you were to have surgery, most of you are old enough now to have had major surgery, but if you're going to have surgery where they're going to apply anesthesia and they're going to put you under, um, a, a variety of things are going to happen in, as you prepare for surgery. The first thing that's probably going to happen is the nurse is going to come in. And he or she's going to say, hey, your surgery's in a few hours. I'm going to do some things, put an IV in you, get you prepped. Uh, and a little bit, the anesthesiologist will come in and talk to you about that. And so they say what they got to say, and then they leave. And then eventually the anesthesiologist comes in, whoever he or she is, and says, you know, have you ever been put under before? Have you had any bad reactions to anesthesia? They're going to ask you basic fundamental questions like that. They're going to probably say something to the effect that we're going to give you a little something now to help take the edge off. You won't put you to sleep, but it'll make you drowsy probably. But then we're going to take you into the operating room. Once we get you into the operating room, we're going to administer this anesthesia, however they're going to do that. And we're going to count to five backwards. And by the time we get to, or ten backwards, by the time we get to five, you'll be out. And you'll wake up in the recovery room and you have no idea what happened. Do you have any questions about that? No. Okay, the doctor will be in. And so the doctor or the doctor's team, depending on how many people are going to be performing the procedure on you, will come in and whoever the lead physician is in your case is going to probably ask you a question right off the bat. What are we doing to you? Just to see if you even know what we're doing. Which leg are we operating on or which arm or whatever to make sure that there's comprehension and there's clarity of what's going on. Then they're going to tell you what they're going to do and how long it's going to take and what their hopes are. And then they're going to ask you if you have any questions. And then they're going to say the all important question at the end. Are you ready? And you're going to probably say something to the effect, I'm as ready as I'm ever going to be. Okay, so let's do this. And at that point in time, you turn your entire will and life over to that doctor, to that team of healthcare professionals, and it's it. You turn it over. They, t they roll you into the emergency room. They hook up the devices. They put you to sleep, and you're totally powerless what happens next. They could put a carrot nose on you. They could put a kangaroo tail on you. They could do whatever they want to you. But, but you become entirely ready for them to do something to you because you want to be better on the back end of that, right? That's why you're going through all this. And from a spiritual context, this is what we're talking about, what it means to become entirely ready, that we're tired of our soul hurting, we're tired of this soul sickness, that we're entirely ready for God to cleanse our heart, to cleanse our soul. And so we become willing for that to happen. And, uh, and so we have to get to that space that we're willing to do that, just like we have to get to a space that we're willing to go into a hospital and let them do a procedure. Sin is complicated and never simple. It's just not. Sin is very complicated. It always starts small, whatever the sin is that we get into. But then the next thing you know, it's a rhinoceros sitting on your chest with his face and his horn right in your face, breathing down your neck, trying to squash you. And you're like, how did this happen? How did this get here? How did this get to this point? Because it always starts small and it's complicated as it can ever get. But when it comes to good things, when it comes to God's will for our life, when it comes to good orderly direction in our life, it's simple. It is simple. It's simply put our will in line with God's and we're going to get along okay. And that's what's asked of us. But sin... Um, takes on many forms and, and it can look a lot of different ways and, and that's the challenge of it and this is what happened to David David got caught up in something that started small it started in his mind and then he acted on it and then it blew into something else then it ultimately ended up in immorality ended up in murder before it was all over and then trying to cover it up I mean I could come up with probably seven sins easy that happened out of this story with David 
It's complicated at the end of the day. Um, but what's, what is the right thing to do is pretty simple. You need to get clean. You need to come clean. You need to get right with God. And the, and, and the rest will take care of itself. So in our scripture in this first section, they point to sin in three different ways. They look at it. They call it wrongdoings. In, in the common English Bible that I just read from, they call it guilt. They, 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 and most editions call it evil. Uh, some might say transgression. Some might say iniquities. But all the, whether it's character defects, shortcomings, whatever those are, they're all synonymous. They all mean the same thing. And it's really a Greek word. It's harmatia, which means that we miss the mark. That's what the word means. We miss the mark. We miss the idea, God's idea for our life in this particular area of our life. Most of us live very compartmentalized lives that we could come into our life and open up. It's like a locker room. We've got all these lockers, and I open up this locker, and I'm totally sold out for God, but I pull over in this locker, maybe not so much. And we all have varying degrees of that. Um, and so, but that's what the, the, they're pointing out. And so as we segue into this next section of Scripture, verses 7 through 13, we clearly see that God is merciful on the humble. And what did I mean? I mean that God's not giving us something that we deserve because of our humility. Humility to what? Humility to confess that we're broken. A humility to confess that we're lost and that we've made a mistake, that we're sorry, and we're at a point where we're ready to do something different. It's that kind of humility that we get to, each and every one of us. Verses 7 through 13 say, We humbly ask God to remove the sin in our soul and to fill it with joy, because that's what soul sickness happens. It robs us of our joy. And so we walk around in a joyous spirit, we, we, uh, 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 with no joy in our life, I should say. And, and, uh, but we still go through the motions sometimes. We still come to church. We might read a, 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 the upper room on a daily basis, check the boxes, whatever, but there's really no joy in our life because we got this thing, whatever this thing is. Last week I used the illustration of a burn hole in the carpet um, covering up with the podium. Um, but whatever it is, it robs us. And this is what happened to David. David had had no joy left in his life because he had all this sin in his life. It was robbing him. It separated him from God. It separated him from his people. And it caused him a great deal amount of pain. And, uh, but we have to humbly ask God to remove that junk from our life. That is our prayer. It should be our prayer pretty much every day. It should be this, this prayer of humility to ask God to cleanse our heart and to restore the joy that once existed. So this little exchange, David comes clean, but he didn't come clean on his own. He comes clean because God put Nathan in his life to call David out on his stuff. David was at a point where he could confess it, you know, audibly to God, even internally in his mind. He could say, God, you know my sin, you know my shortcomings. But God requires more than that. God requires us to be clean with another human being. It's what validates that we've been honest with ourselves and with God when we're honest with somebody else. But until that happens, we can come up here during communion, we can pray all we want, we can journal all we want about the truth, but until that's shared with another human being, we haven't been honest. It's just part of the deal. It's part of the spiritual journey. And so this is what we see in this little scripture here between David, and this is Nathan calling David out. It says, you are the man, Nathan told David. That is what the Lord God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel and delivered you from Saul's power. He's reminding him that what the position he's in is by the grace of God. It's a gift from God. It isn't anything he did to deserve it, earn it, or achieve it. It's by grace that he was put in that position. He's reminding David quickly of that. I gave, you, I gave your master's house to you. I gave his wives into your embrace. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. If that was too little, I would have given you even more. He's reminding that God was going to give him everything to help bring about the kingdom of God amongst his people. Why have you despised the Lord's words by doing what is evil in his eyes? So he's calling him out right then. You have struck down Uriah, the Hittite, with the sword and taken his wife as your own, Sheba. You used the Ammonites to kill him. Because of that, because of you despised me and took the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, as your own, the sword will never leave your house. 
This is what the Lord says. I am making trouble come against you from inside your own family. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives away and give them to your friend, and he will have sex with your wives in broad daylight. You did what you did secretly, but I will do what I'm doing before all Israel in the light of day. David says, I've sinned against the Lord, David said to Nathan. The Lord has removed your sin, Nathan replied to David. You won't die. So you're not going to perish. He's not going to kill you. And so when you read that scripture, that is what the wrath of God looks like. It's not that God is punishing David. It's, you know, God is going to remove his blessing and his grace, his presence from David, and the sin itself will absorb David. So the repercussions that he's suffering because of his iniquities is the, the punishment is in the iniquity. It's like having a hot stove. Mark, don't touch the stove. But you, you just got to go over and touch it. And you get burnt. It isn't God burning you. It isn't your parents burning you. It's the fact that you defied the principle and you chose to do it your way and you got burnt. And it's the same way with any sin, whether it's about power, whether it's about glory, whether it's about greed, whether it's about sex, whether it's, whatever it's about. Whatever the sin is in our life, you know, it's got a punishment within itself. You do that, you're going to get this. You do that, you open the door for this. And so all these possibilities come into place, but it isn't God doing anything to do you. And God will allow you to take the test as often as you need to. As often as you want to go touch the stove, if you need to learn the lesson one more time, then go touch it, you know. God will try to influence you with the help of the Holy Spirit, but at the end of the day, he can't coerce you not to do that. Your free will will psh, touch it if you like. But the beautiful part about it, and this is what we see in David's story, is that God took the first step towards David, and he had to use another human being to do it. And if you think about your own life and your own challenges, there's probably been some what I would call angels in your own life that have just showed up at the right time, said the right thing, gave you a phone call, gave you a text, called you on an email, you know, sent you an email, hit you up on social media, or you heard a talk, you heard a song, you heard whatever you needed to, to kind of wake you up a little bit. That you need to take a look at this in your life. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's that God consciousness working in our life. And that's God taking the first step to try to reconcile you back to him. So he took the first step towards David in a big way. And God forgave David because what happened? Because David came clean. And that's a two-way street when it comes to forgiveness. I have to come clean. I have to. You know, it's no different than these little children if they would do something against the house rules, whatever the rules of engagement are. And, and of course you forgive them. You're your parents. You love them. They're your children. But you still want them to come clean and own what they did. You know, we're, we're not going to go any further until you own what you did. You got to own the fact that you didn't do what it is you said you were going to do. Until you do that, we just can't reconcile this. You have to own it. And it's the same way we would discipline a, a child. It's the same thing for us as human beings. We can have our junk. And some of us have hung on our junk our whole lives. We've never shared the darker things about our life with anybody, whether it's about our sex conduct, whether it's about our money management, it's about drugs or booze or whatever, whatever in our life, dishonesty with our employers or as an employee. We mean going down the line, we could pick a thousand different subjects, but we all got our junk, things that have happened to us, things that we've done to others that we're not happy about. We don't want anybody to know about it. We don't want the world to know about it. But, and, and we want God's forgiveness. We lust for God's blessings. But I'm telling you, until, that, until we come clean, it doesn't mean you have to come clean to the whole world. Yeah, there's some denominations that would have you come up and share your junk right here in front of everybody. I'm not asking you to do that. But God's making it clear that your junk has to be shared with somebody, a professional, clergy, a trusted friend, a small group, somebody that you get with and say, you know what, I'm going through this message at church, this summer in the Psalms, we're on these Psalms of David, this whole thing about confession, transparency, truth, being honest, keeps coming up again and again and again. And I got some parts of my life that I've just never come clean with anybody about. And I don't, I don't, I can't totally identify how it's holding me back, but, but scripture tells me that I'm held back from it. And so I want that release. I want joy at a level I've never experienced before in my life. And so you find out who that person is, and then you go do it. 
And I'm promising you, friends, I can promise you, if you do this, it will change your life. You'll never be the same person again. You will never be the same. Mark my words, you will come up here and tell me, Pastor Harold, you were right. I have never felt the way that I feel now. I'm 50 years old, I'm 80 years old, I'm 90 years old, I'm 20 years old. I don't care. And this is the spiritual principle that will go on for the rest of your life. That if you got, you're as sick as your secrets. If you got a secret, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause you a lot of problems. Separate you from God, separate you from each other, but it's going to cause a really bad soul sickness inside your life. God forgave the whole world because of the unselfishness of Jesus Christ. Amen? That is the truth. He gave that up for that. Jesus had a choice. Do I go to the cross or do I not? Do I take on the sins of the world or do I not? He didn't have to, but he chose to. But if you think about that, what, you think about that moment at the cross, you think about what happened when Jesus was nailed to the cross and while he's hanging on that cross for six hours until his heart exploded. Basically, you can say that Jesus died from a broken heart. But during that time on that cross, you know this story well, where he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God does not, cannot, in any way, any shape, condone or pardon anything that's not holy. And sin is not holy. And so, since Jesus took on the sin of the world and represented sin, God had to turn away from him to pull his presence away from Jesus. And when he did, Jesus was all alone in that moment. And he felt the sin of the world, not just our own personal sin, but it's all the sin of the world on his life. And this, you know it had to just be a pain that we can't even begin to identify with. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is the sin of the world, friends. And this is, what, this is why we make a big deal out of Jesus. And this is why we follow a Jesus-looking God. And this is why we try to live a Jesus-centered life. Because Jesus showed us by example what it means to live the kingdom life. Amen? God, by any means, can't clear, I should say can't clear the guilty. I should say can't. Can't. It's impossible because God's holy. You will never be in the presence of God if you're not holy. And so this whole process of being in the presence of God for eternity, we're going to be made holy. Hopefully that process starts on this side through our salvation process, but we will never be fully in the presence of God until we're like Jesus. And so here's a really important lesson. David did not lose his salvation. He lost the joy of his salvation. It's really, really important to know this. He didn't lose his adoption with God as one of God's kids or his place in heaven. But through his separation from God, just like Jesus had his separation from God, and the joy of who Jesus was was gone, this is what happened to David. He lost his joy. There's a lot of bitter Christians out there. There's a lot of casual Christians out there. There's a lot of people who say, yeah, I'm Christian but they haven't read the Word of God for who knows how long. Hadn't even probably been to church for who knows how long. And if they do come to church, they check a box. But for most part, if you shine a light on their life, they're just living for themselves, whatever their selves look like. They might not be out committing crimes or doing anything obnoxious, but they're just going through the motions, living for themselves. And they don't have much joy in their life. And joy not to be confused with happiness, because happiness can, vary, can fluctuate day in and day out based on our circumstances. But joy is something that's part of our soul. It's part of a presence that it's in our DNA, that despite the circumstances, I have joy. I have joy in Christ. I have joy knowing I'm right with the Lord. I have joy knowing that I'm trying to live the simple life, which is trying to put my will and life in line with God's. And that's what happened to David. But once he confessed it, his life changed. These last verses really says that God desires a broken spirit to transform us into the image of God. We have to come fully broken. You don't have to burn your life completely into the ground, but you have to come with a desire that you know that you can't fix yourself. You know that no human power is going to fix you, that the power to heal your soul sickness is only going to come from God, from a power greater than you. 
And so you come with this broken spirit. You have to come to the end of yourself. Not everybody has to go all the way in. There's an old George Strait song. Anybody who loves George Strait probably knows the song. I found Jesus on the floor of, of, of the jail, you know, of the, of the sheriff's floor or whatever. And that was my story. That's where I found Jesus. That's where I come to the end of myself. That's when I said the most honest prayer I've ever said in my life. God help me. And my life has never been the same from that moment till now. But at somewhere, somehow or another, whether you do it sitting in church or you do it at, in, in the Clayton County Jail or wherever you do it at, you have to come to this place where you come to the end of yourself and say, God, here's my life. And, and, and you can't hold nothing back. It's kind of like, if you, I don't know if you've ever had a garage sale or you've had an estate sale yourself and, and, and you're selling stuff and then people start to show up and they start to take stuff and, you're, and then all of a sudden they grab this and like, well, I think I'll take this. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, man, I don't know if I really want to get rid of that. I kind of like that. I want to hang on to that. And so you're kind of having this turmoil. But it's all or nothing. It's like, come in, God, and take whatever you want. Are you really willing to do that in your life? And it, for, for a lot of us, it'll be a radical shift on what God's going to ask us to walk away from in your life. Are you prepared to do that? Are you entirely ready? Are you ready to walk away from the worldly things that you're attached to, that you idolize, that's very much idol in your life? Are you willing to walk away from this thing that you put so much power in? And that's really the acid test when it gets down to it. What we learn, or what I've learned, definitely, that there's no, there's, there's not near as much fun in the world as there is in the Father's house. The Lord knows I went out into the world and tried to have a lot of fun. Can I get a witness? I mean, come on. I mean, I really tried to have a lot of fun out there in the world. And it did everything but kill me. Um, I can promise you this last 30, almost 35 years now has been the best years of my life by far. And that's because I've tried to live in my father's house, at least stay on the front porch. Yeah, I mean, I've been in the living room the whole time, but I at least tried to stay on the front porch. Uh, and it's just been a much better life. I couldn't be happier in life. But the measure of all this, the measure of your love for God is the estimate of your own sin. How do you estimate your own sin in your life? And do you look at it honestly? Do you just sit in reflection in your, in your meditation at time? And say, and just call it what it is. Selfishness, dishonesty, greed, sloth, sin, you know, going down the line. Anger, pride, lust. Just picking out the seven big ones. But, but bottom line is, do I, do I take inventory of my life? Do I really look at my life the way it is? And if you really want a bold prayer, friends, when it comes to this, here's a bold prayer as it relates to the sin in your life. Ask God to make whatever your hurt, habit, or hang-up is objectionable to you the way it's objectionable to God. God, I keep doing this. I can't seem to stop. I go a period and I don't do it, but then the next thing you know, 30 days later, I'm doing it again, or six months later. God, please make this objectionable to me. That's a bold prayer, friends. Hope you're brave enough to pray it, because look out if you are. Make this objectionable to me. Help me to see my life, my character, my thoughts, my mind, my soul, the way that you see it. Help me to see it the way you see it. Help me to see the world as you see it. Help me to see my neighbor as we watch Urban D, who's a friend of mine and part of my inner circle, but also in my mentorship, Tommy Urban, who you saw in that video in the beginning. But the point he's making, help me to see my neighbor like that. And, and, and those are bold prayers, but that's what we're asked to do. God, change me. Am I entirely ready for God to change me like Jesus, to have a kingdom outlook, to live a Christ-centered life? Is it possible you don't truly confess your sins? This is a question I'm posing to you. When was the last time you cried, and that should say out, in the night because of your failures? When's the last time in your own privacy, wherever that may be, in a deer stand, in your bedroom at night, sitting on your couch, in church, in your car, wherever, where you just had that moment where you got really emotional about your life, about the failures in your life, about the junk in your life, about the hurts, the habits and hang-ups, the things that have happened to you, but also that you've 
participated in against others? When is the last time that's happened for you? And if you haven't had that experience, I would encourage you to think about that today, especially as we go into communion time, to reflect on some of those things and realize, and, and again, asking God to help you see that stuff the way God sees it. And it'll, it'll have an impact on you. And lastly, God provides forgiveness, but there needs to be confession on your part. It's no way out of that. There's no shortcut. There's no loophole. There's no all, yeah, but you have to do this part. This has to happen forever. This principle of transparency, of being trustworthy, to be honest, has to happen. The truth has to happen in your life on a regular basis. And you remember what Tom Cruise said to Jack Nicholson, you can't handle the truth, right? Well, the truth, we, we can't handle the truth. That's why we lie about it. That's why we try to sweep it under the covers. But friends, the truth will set us free. But we have to come clean. This is what God's asking us. But the ball's in our court. He's not going to coerce us into this. He may send plenty of Nathans in our life to help try to get us here. But it's going to be up to us to say, okay, here it is, the good, the bad, and the ugly of my life. And once you do that, friends, it will change your life forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the life of David, and thank you for the willingness of the writers of David to share truthfully about his life, his hurts, his habits, his hang-ups, his selfishness, his dishonesty, all things as broken people we can relate to. We all relate to King David, Lord. And so we just ask for your forgiveness, which we know you provide, but you ask us to come clean. So we pray for that willingness today to bring our hearts out of the dark into the light so you can cleanse them and heal us of our iniquities and help us to get really centered on living a Jesus-centered life, following a Jesus-looking God to help usher in the kingdom of, of your kingdom now and forever. And so we pray this boldly in your son's name. And all God's people said, amen. Hi again, this is Harold. Thanks for listening to our weekly message and podcast. I hope that we have shared something helpful to you wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Just so you know a little bit more about us, we are Hill Tran United. Hill Tran United is an alliance between Hillsboro United Methodist Church and Transformation United Methodist Church. We are kingdom churches and kingdom communities for people who aren't into church. We meet Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. at Hillsboro United Methodist Church and 11 a.m. at Transformation United Methodist Church. Both churches are located in the northeastern tip of the beautiful Ozark Mountains, located in Jefferson County, Missouri. We also meet during the week in smaller groups that we call life groups and home churches, and that's how we make it relational. We hear regularly from people from all over who are engaging in personal and group studies based on our teaching, and we would love to know if that is happening where you are at. If you want to connect with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Vimeo, and YouTube, or you can download our app from your favorite app store. Just search for the app titled Our Church by Church Dev and enter in Hilltran United, and you can access all of our available audio, video teachings, plus through the app you can, and, or our website, you can download our PowerPoint slides, bulletin, sermon notes, and discussion questions. It's all there for you. And lastly, if you want to learn more about how you can support Hillsboro United Methodist Church or Transformation United Methodist Church financially, please go to www.hilltran.org for more information and to give. We appreciate anything you can do to help. Hey, thanks for being a member of this extended church family. I'm glad we are in this together as kingdom people commencing shoulder to shoulder to help people rediscover life and experience the kingdom of God.